all searching for happiness. Since we spend the greater part of our lives working, why don't we look for happiness at work? In France and Germany, the percentage of engaged workers, by which I mean those who get up with a smile on their face, is 11%. Disengaged workers, those who go to work to earn a salary but take no initiative, count for 61% in France and 58% in Germany. The third category are those we call actively disengaged, who are so unhappy at work that they turn up every day merely to display their unhappiness. Basically, these are people who come to sabotage or destroy. The big question we have to ask when we see these figures is, were those employees like that on the first day when we recruited them? If you see the evolution of mankind, we started as individual nomads and we organized ourselves into tribes. The tribes, because they had to have a social structure, created a leader. The ethos of the leader was that the leader was meant to keep the tribe together. And slowly the tribes became larger and we became larger organizations. But all the while, the ethos has always been that the leader is in the service of the people. When large organizations were created, which is industrial organizations, they converted this leadership into what I call a paradigm of hierarchy, a pyramid, where they just didn't have one leader, they had series of leaders. And each leader was doing a little more than the previous leader. The employees were actually stuck inside the pyramid, and therefore the pyramid suffocation started happening. A lot of the techniques were originally developed in the military and then brought back into industry from there in order to be able to organize anything on a large scale. I mean, you had to like remove people's skills and remove their sensibilities and, and remove their ability to think about what they were doing in order to create these blind chains of command. And it's very much like what you had to do of soldiers uh, in order to have them blindly following orders. In England, at the end of the 18th century, they recruited illiterate peasants who didn't know what it meant to come to work at a specified time. So they made them clock in. Sometimes the peasants brought whiskey with them, and when they were a bit tired, they would leave their posts. So foremen were put in charge. A whole machine was set in motion to control the behavior of these peasants. And now we find ourselves today with the same methods and the same philosophy, but a population that's nothing like illiterate peasants. But there are still factories in Europe where a 40-year-old worker has to ask permission to go to the toilet. The situation today is paradoxical. Ever greater productivity and flexibility is demanded from employees, but the structures in which workers are supposed to evolve haven't changed. As we move away from the industrialization phase to more digital phase, where the consumers are out there, the value and the innovation is, is going to become very important. Every employee will count, and every employee has to create that value. Now, when the employee feels suffocated in that pyramid structure, under the hierarchy, and the leaders are not willing to let go their power, it is impossible for industrialized pyramid organization to transform itself and that is the debate which is happening in the world today in terms of is this structure relevant? The answer is no. So what structure is relevant? And the most important question is how are we going to move from this pyramid suffocating structure to a refreshing open structure which, which will allow every employee to innovate? It is possible to let employees take the initiative and reorganize things for themselves. Some companies have decided to shake up the system and invent alternative models of work. In Germany, the United States, France, India and Belgium, they're challenging preconceived ideas.
Founded by Émile Poult in 1883 in Montauban in the south of France, the Poult Group is a major player in the biscuit market. Nicole has been working here for 30 years. She knew the company when it operated along traditional lines. Hi, what's up? It used to be a strict hierarchy. We had a factory manager, staff manager, four men, and production line managers. The company had a strict hierarchical culture. There were the underlings. We were like soldiers, robots. Turn up, do what you're told, don't ask questions. And the chiefs. I was a production line chief. I was responsible for just one line. I had to sort out people's holidays, conflicts, if there were any, and be sure that the line was functioning without a hitch and everything has to do with that. We were watched really closely and strictly regimented about what we should and shouldn't do. We'd soon end up in the office if we'd been a bit naughty. In 2001, with Poult in serious difficulties, along came Carlos Verkeren, a Belgian entrepreneur who used to work for an investment fund. I've implemented redundancy plans and I know the damage they can cause. He settled in Montauban, far from the financial markets, determined to turn Poult around with a new approach. Close down factories, sack people, cut costs, anyone can do that. You don't need to be fantastically qualified. You just have to lack a bit of sensitivity and go for it. But to turn things around through innovation, new products, that's more complicated. That's what we decided to do. In 2006, he gathered everyone employed at the factory for a brainstorming session. Everyone was invited to come up with new ideas, whatever their job or their position in the hierarchy. We were invited to take part in this new organization right across the board from top management down to simple employees like me. And they asked us, how do you envisage the factory in the future? How could things be improved? And things like that. Working groups were set up to meet and continue the discussions. There was a lot of skepticism. You're manipulating us. You're just pretending to involve us. But you already made up your mind what to do. It took time. After a while, people finally ended up saying, hey, he really has taken on board what we've been saying. After a great many meetings, it was decided to get rid of all intermediary hierarchical posts. We didn't just say, let's get rid of the chiefs. After lots of meetings and thinking, we finally realized that, yes, we could keep a production line going perfectly well without someone to oversee it. Well, there was a clash because when you have a hierarchical position and overnight it's taken away, you, you really have to come to terms with accepting that. Most of the former chiefs left because they felt that losing their titles sort of diminished them in the outside world. They were no longer chiefs. They lost their power, so I think they felt um, underestimated. What we're trying to put in place poses real questions about the role of the manager. They spend a lot of time controlling, checking and reporting on what people are doing. Well, we freed all that time. And all that time freed from managing, what do they do with it? That's when sometimes people get lost. The people who stayed are the ones who actually could do without their chief status. So my role was to take to that step because I too had to be able to flourish in my own work. Under the guidance of the former director, now a site animator, the ex-managers found they had been attributed new functions. Many of them switched to what we call progress technicians. How can I help you? And also, how can I teach you what I know? My job today is to help the operators along the way, so they can feel good about their work and do their jobs in the best conditions. For the former bosses, it may have been a hard pill to swallow. But the other employees weren't necessarily any more enthusiastic at first. Lots of people were against it, including employees like me. They thought we were heading straight to the wall. 
It's a lot easier just to be given orders, to have someone tell you what to do. You don't have to think, you just do it. Now, when we tell teams, decide for yourself, it's a lot harder, it takes longer, it can cause tensions, and the team has to deal with that. You could always blame the chief before, but now there isn't any. Nowadays, all decisions are taken by small groups representative of the entire company. The pallets, I haven't got room. Where should I put them? You stuff some here and you stuff some there. Everyone does that. And soon you don't know where the products are. We have to decide on the exact zone for each item. Concerning the apricot, we had to leave the pallet aside yesterday and we won't deal with it. What I like about these groups is you have all different kinds of populations. You work with engineers, just as you work with the production line staff, and that gives excellent results. There are a lot of things that chiefs did before, and someone still has to do them. So operators developed new skills, took on specific tasks. For example, they do all the planning, the scheduling of the production week, who's going to be on holiday, who's not there, the clocking in. There's no hierarchy anymore structuring everything. There's no more executive committee. Investment decisions are made by a group of workers, employees and managers. For the personnel to be able to make these decisions, the company's figures and results have to be available to all. The enterprise is obliged to be transparent. I got a new skill. I was trained on PCs because they weren't my thing. They scared me. I'm happy because the thing about running a line is when we explain it to people, they ask us questions. It's not like being only a factory worker, you know, do this, do that, clock off, come back tomorrow. It is different. I can't say that we're no longer managed, but we organize the day how we want depending on the work we have to do. We work with our body, of course, but also with our head and with a professional conscience. Colleagues were colleagues. They weren't my clients. Now I know they're my clients. If I don't do things well, I know I'll be hurting the people behind me. When they're not happy, they come to see me and I improve my product. To everyone's surprise, it worked. Poult is recruiting and is back in profit. In fact, it's such a success that other large companies have been sending human resources teams to the Montauban factory to learn their secret. They think we're Martians. <laughs> we're like Martians. People often say, yes, but your operators are special. No, they're the same. The conditions are different. But we didn't choose them. They've been with the firm a long time. They're people who have a lot of love, in fact, for Poult. Ah, love. But love doesn't solve every problem. Notably, the question of sharing the profits. Money is perhaps the one and only thing we have trouble talking about. We can talk about everything but salary. Maybe we can improve that. Liberty and confidence are all very well. But how do you share the wealth produced by this collective effort? In Nantes, in Western France, there's a company where the employees have taken money matters to heart. Chronoflex supplies and maintains flexible tubing. Hey, Samir, it's Sebastian. Hi, Sebastian. I'd like to register a service. The idea is simple. A service that functions 24-7 all year round. We're there within an hour and we fix the problem in an hour. Wherever there's tubing, funeral services, boats, cranes, wherever you have tubes. For a decade, Chronoflex thrived in an extraordinary environment. Profits flowed, the company was hiring and the workers were happy. But in 2008, the Great Recession rocked the capitalist world and the small French company trembled. For CEO Alexander Gerard, the prospect of slimming down by laying off workers was traumatic. I'm a team leader, a guy who was born to build things, to develop things, to grow things. I wasn't made to fire people. It's not my style, I just don't like it. To get things off on the right foot, he proposed to change everything. In January 2012, he gathered together his workforce and, as at Poult, the boss invited them to reorganize themselves. 
In the course of this mass brainstorm, the pyramidal hierarchy was replaced by small autonomous teams that he calls speedboats. We explained to them that lots of things wrong with the company, and we said to them, you, you are going to fix these problems, we're not going to take care of it anymore. And that's that. Not really knowing where they were going, they began by having a party. Monday morning, back at work. The question remained of how to make this new autonomy function. When something needs to be dealt with, a group of volunteers is formed. They come to a decision and tell everyone. The decision is implemented. It's that simple. To better allow his teams to take their responsibilities, Alexander Gerard chose a radical option. He set sail. To prove that it wasn't just hot air, five months later, I left the company for a year and went on a trip around the world. But just as he was packing his bags, his employees had a little surprise for him. We launched a wellness workshop and we asked employees what they wanted to focus on. And the first subject, of course, was salary. Oh, that really freaked me out. Here am I going to the other side of the world and they're about to talk about the most sensitive subject in the enterprise. We said, OK, how would you like to be paid? And we asked everyone to give us their ideas. With Alexandre Gérard anxiously following events from the other side of the world, their initiative revolutionized the system of remuneration for all the company's employees. So for each of our colleagues in the field, we set up an individual account, and above his break-even level, he gets 15% off his net profit. On top of this bonus, the technicians receive a second share-out linked to the success of their team. So that means that everyone has an individual interest, but also has an interest in the collective performance. That's fine for the technicians in the field. But what about the employees back at head office? After the issue of the offices came about regarding us, who don't bring in money, we contribute to their good working conditions, but we don't bring in any turnover. To ensure that everyone was happy, another bonus was put in place a profitability bonus. Every six months, we look at the company figures and draw a line. We take 15% of the profits and share them equally between all the employees. Once we've done that, turnover increased by 15% without anyone doing a thing. And the really good news is that everyone will get a profitability bonus. And so this is a great challenge. Everyone gets a percentage, there are no discussions about salaries, 99% of the people are happy. It's good for the employees and it's good for the company as well. Someone said to me the other day, the bonus is great, but now I've got more taxes to pay. What bothers them now is having to pay taxes. That's what you hear them saying out there. A decent salary, aspirations towards social improvement and recognition. Are those the keys to happiness at work? Pult and Chronoflex are what's called liberated companies. The term was coined by Brian Carney and Isaac Getz in their book Freedom Inc. Isaac Getz is a professor of management and innovation who studied over 200 companies around the world to define his concept. We define a liberated company as one in which a large majority of the employees are given total freedom and responsibility to undertake all the actions which they themselves, not the superiors nor procedures, judge to be best for the company. If private enterprises can be liberated, could public services be liberated in this way too? In Belgium, a number of ministries have accepted the challenge. In the Transport Ministry, now called SPF Mobility, 1,400 employees are getting ready for the big shake-up. Jan and Veronique are part of the first group of volunteers. 
As at Poult and Chronoflex, they began by organizing workshops and consulting the personnel. To spark a revolution, you have to start at the bottom. Over 100 workers took part in the workshops. They told us they wanted to be able to work where they wanted, when they wanted, even weekends, so they could pause during the day to fetch their children from school or to go shopping. Most of all, they wanted to change the style of management, to no longer be treated like children, but like autonomous persons capable of making decisions and to enjoy the trust of their bosses to take initiatives. But this freedom has a very different meaning for the unions. Real decisions weren't taken in these workshops. The unions were completely short-circuited and kept systematically at a distance. We were presented with a fait accompli each time, or else there was a simulac of dialogue in which it was clear from the start that nothing we said would be taken into consideration. Laurent Ledoux is the ministry's new director. He worked in banking before volunteering to come and put into practice the liberation of SPF mobility. You shouldn't think it's all fairy tale. To liberate energies, sometimes you have to go through a period of conflict. The thing is to orchestrate it in such a way that the conflict leads to something positive. Because if the conflict is poorly orchestrated, people lose their tempers and it goes off in all directions. But if there's no conflict, there's nothing, no stress, nobody moves and nothing changes. First of all, the ministry got rid of clocking in, replacing hours worked with objectives achieved. Objectives, that's what was missing. In a lot of departments, staff presence was checked, but what the staff accomplished wasn't checked at all. The absence of objectives is a demotivating factor for a lot of people. So setting goals motivates them because it clarifies why they've come to work. Henceforth, no matter how many hours it takes, the main thing is to reach your goal. Easier to say than to accomplish in public service. Employer and employee really must trust each other, because the employer could say, you haven't achieved your objectives, so you haven't worked enough. And while I might have done a lot of overtime, which is no longer accounted for, I was unable to achieve my objectives for any given reasons. So the objectives must really be clear. It's all a matter of trust. It's very important to understand that these are not just new work methods. They are part of an ideology that is designed to make us forget about a certain number of social gains, the length of the working week, for instance. On the face of it, it's nice to no longer have to clock in, but we're throwing the baby out with the bathwater, because you can also forget about the 38-hour week, and you must concentrate only on reaching your objectives. Effectively, there's a clash between two conceptions of work. Basically, the idea is to no longer pay for hours worked, but for pieces produced. Sure, I work too much, but if one day I need to go shopping, I go. And when I come back, I don't have to clock in. And that is trust. They're getting people used to the idea that they have to achieve their objectives, even if they have to work evenings and weekends, until they're burnt out. If I don't feel like answering, I switch off my iPad. But when I see a message, I might as well answer it straight away. That way I don't forget. I love my job, so I really don't mind answering an email at 9 in the evening. So at night, if I get emails at 10 p.m., I reply. Even at 5 in the morning, I reply. I always have my iPad with me. For Laurent Ledoux, the ministry's president, liberating people also means giving them responsibilities. In a lot of organizations like ours, you have people who work a great deal and very well. And on the other side, you have people who are frankly givers. Let's be honest about it. And it shouldn't be like that. At present, the organization allows it, and their colleagues allow it. In the liberated work system that I foresee, it won't be up to the boss to tell them. Sooner or later, all colleagues must feel united, and to accomplish their goals, everyone must pull their weight. 
En gros, la philosophie Their plan is to create systems where workers are in competition with one another and to destroy all forms of solidarity. Worker solidarity against the hierarchy or a collective competition towards a common goal. Once more, two worlds clash. In the concept of the liberated organization, class warfare is a thing of the past. Some people don't realize what's happening. Some criticize it before they've even understood it. But on the other hand, there are those who have seized the new dynamic and they've become spokespersons by their own example, much more than I ever could with my own words. Second stage, after work time, work space. We're on a floor that has yet to be refurbished. As you can see, there are still walls on each side. It looks more like a clinic or a hospital. Bit by bit, the old barriers fall. The small offices are transformed into an open space so that everyone can work together. It's the principle of the dynamic office. No more personal desks. Everyone works where they want. The first advantage is better transparency. One of the objectives of this project is to break down the walls, both in the literal and figurative sense. That way, people don't need to get up and go into the next office every time. They can ask their questions directly to their colleagues. The best that can be said is that the verdict isn't unanimous. This dynamic office principle means that no one has their place. When you arrive, you have to find a space, and if there isn't one, you have to fight with your colleagues. You should be over there. What I like is that I can choose whom I'll sit next to. So if, for example, I need to work on a European issue, I'll go and sit next to a colleague who deals with that. Regarding the open space, for some teams it works well, there's a good atmosphere. For others, well, it looks like a cemetery. Admittedly, it looks nicer here, that's obvious. But working in these conditions is something else. These people are sitting, looking at screens, knowing that everyone who passes, even visitors, can see what they're doing. It creates a sort of total social control. It's hard to have private communications, for example, to make an appointment with your doctor. And everyone knows what everyone else is doing. To set an example, as soon as the refurbishment is complete, the director intends to leave the ivory tower of his predecessors and join his personnel in the open space. You have to be coherent as much as possible in what you do. If we have this dynamic for the teams, everyone must join in. The enemy is ego. The ego of the hierarchy that needs a 500 square feet corner office with three sets of windows and a large meeting room. All these external features, these signs of power, that's the worst enemy of a culture based on the concept of happiness at work. Because the culture of the ego induces a culture of control to ensure that one remains somehow always above those below. In Belgium, Laurence Van Hee was one of the architects of the liberation of the ministries. For her, humans are not just resources. So she changed her job title from Human Resources Director to Chief Happiness Officer. As soon as we manage to deal with the inflated egos of team managers wherever they are in the hierarchy and to create, in some way, egoless managers who consider that the team's success is more important than their own, who consider that the collective is more important than the individual, from that moment on we'll be able to begin to change many things. But liberating a company in this way is a tricky undertaking because almost every business has its quota of little bosses. According to Jean-François Zobrist, a flagship boss of liberated companies, there are way too many. 
About 3% of a company's employees are time wasters. And because of them, a structure has been set up to manage the other 97 who are serious. And workers are bullied by the structure. They accomplish barely 50% of what they're capable. It's not just workers who are stifled by this structure. Over the last 30 years, with the rise of information technology, industrial management norms have been applied to all professions, with a multiplication of the number of advisory, managerial, supervisory and monitoring posts, putting a stranglehold on the employees. The result is a sense of disembodiment in the modern world of work, a deep unease in one's job. A professor at the London School of Economics, American anthropologist David Graeber has an explanation. He puts it down to the huge increase in what he calls bullshit jobs. There just seems to be a general principle that the more obviously your work benefits other people, the less they pay you. You know, there's a few exceptions. There's doctors, airline pilots, they, act, you know, they do something that's clearly necessary and they get paid well. But for the most part, the kind of people whose work is really a obvious social benefit, whether it's a nurse, whether it's a garbage collector. If we didn't have garbage collectors, it'd be in big trouble. If we didn't have human resource consultants, it's not clear how the world would be in any way a different place. If we didn't have corporate lawyers or, or hedge fund advisors, it might well be distinctly better. <laughs> the more negative your social benefits, the more money you get. So, have we lost all consideration for the workers? For those who toil at the bottom of the work pyramid? For Jean-François Zobrist, what's needed is a re-evaluation. Workers feed everyone, we often forget that. Workers feed the bosses and management. Incidentally, management never goes on strike. But when the workers stop, there's a problem right away. The only knowledge of the West is our workers. All it takes is to liberate them. The management structure has experienced foremen and team leaders, but they're confined to a control function. They have to control since they're controlled by the rest of the hierarchy. Above all things, make good use of your time. For all my life, I've been meeting people who had jobs that they would secretly confide to me didn't really do anything. It seems I keep meeting more and more of them as time goes on. Um, there are certain types of position which build up constantly in large bureaucratic organizations, and I'm including corporations especially in this, which are essentially people who make work for other people who do similar things. They're just pushing papers back and forth between desks, designing new forms of audit culture, new ways of assessing people who are assessing other people. What's paradoxical about this confused era is that the more money they lose, the more control they apply. It's a vicious cycle. One of the things I, I've been fascinated in is how that happens specifically within capitalism. Because capitalism is supposed to be a system where that doesn't happen, where everybody's competing, they're trying to be mean and mean, they're trying to slim down. They're constantly talking about efficiency, downsizing. But when they downsize, they seem to strip down to the minimum the, the number of people who are actually making, maintaining, fixing, moving things, who are actually doing the work, but they actually, they often seem to create even more of the people in the middle who don't really do anything. These people fire the productive staff, they fire the salesmen, because if things aren't going well, it's obviously the fault of the salesman, right? And they hire unproductive people. None of these people actually do anything that's really socially necessary, but there's an escalation process. And a lot of the bureaucratic stuff seems to operate in a very similar way. It's a need created by the fact that other people think that there's a need and it feeds off itself. Of 
couramment. I see companies of two to three hundred people where there's a CEO, a plant manager, a financial director, a marketing director, an administrative director, an accountant, a human resources director, plus all the assistants, the secretaries, dozens of people out of three hundred. I see companies where there are fewer productive staff than unproductive. The problem with the unproductive is not what they cost in salary, it's what they do to keep themselves busy. If we paid them to sit in the sun and do nothing, that would liberate the company. We've gone from the management of men by men for men to the management of figures by figures for figures. We have to come to our senses. During five million years of hunting and gathering, even the chiefs hunted and gathered. During 15,000 years of agriculture, everyone grew things except for the nobility and the clergy. We've never had companies with 30 to 40 percent of parasites like now. It's an invention of the post-war boom years when we made lots of money. Parasites come from parasitos who live at the expense of, but who bring nothing to the system. Deep in Picardy, in northern France, at Jean-François Zobrist's former company, Favi, there are no parasites, no bullshit jobs. The godsend at Favi is the gearbox fork. Over the last 20 years, this foundry has worked its way up to the top rank of European suppliers of this hard-wearing copper alloy car part. The company is so successful, it even exports to China, which isn't well known for importing industrial parts from France. In 1983, Jean-François Zobrist, a former soldier, took the reins of this family business with its dispirited workforce. He implemented his original ideas to turn it into a model of innovative practices. And his methods clearly worked, because people now are clamouring to get hired here. Oh yes, I'm very happy. Actually, when I was told that I got the job, I was so happy, I cried. So contented are Favi's 400 employees, there isn't even a union. There's no union at Favi, there's just a workers' committee. The managing director is president of the workers' council. No, we've never had a union. No, I don't think it's necessary. Not with our ways of working. At Favi, they have an extremely original way of working. The hierarchy has been reduced to a minimum. The director and then the employees, who organize themselves. To reach this state of affairs, Jean-François Zobrist applied two basic principles. Man is good and love the customer. Man is good, so there's no need for supervision as a matter of principle. I have confidence in the workers and the salespeople. They can organize themselves so they're happy, so they're productive, so we earn money in our village. As for loving the customer, you can see it as soon as you walk through the door. In theory, a French factory without a union and without a hierarchy is bound to end up with blood on the wall. But not here. At Favi, it works. So how did Jean-François Zobrist achieve this miracle? First step, improve the work environment. It was the new foundry, no more fumes, no more oil all over the place, much cleaner in blue overalls, and the security panel that improved work a whole lot. Second step, create autonomous teams of people who get on well together to run centers of production known as mini factories, each linked to a customer. Zavrist's so big idea in the beginning was having these mini factories on a human scale where everyone knows everyone else. This gradually led to the overall destructured setup. Destructure. Instead of one large hierarchy, each mini factory is independent, with its own sales team installed in a glass walled office in the middle of the machines and the workers. A salesperson in an office in the middle of the machines who says hello to the workers every morning, when he brings in a contract that means 40 jobs, he's a hero. We uncork the champagne. Rapidly, these mini factories proved highly profitable. 
So much so that Favi has been able in good years to give its employees a bonus worth three months salary. All that from just letting people do things their own way. Trust gets better results than control. The cost of overseeing things is so bloated that any problem caused by the absence of control costs nothing in comparison. So it's a matter of principle for us not checking up on production rates or working hours, nothing. Running a company with no hierarchical control sounds good on paper, but what happens when you have problems with a particular employee? Say, when a lone shirker puts a spanner in the works. What happens when something goes wrong? Well, usually bosses intervene to set things straight again. Now, if someone shows up late for work, it probably means he had a problem of some sort. If it's repeated, it's sorted out first within the manufacturing, because a missing operator throws off the work of the whole team. I try and have a talk with the person about what's wrong. Is he having problems? Does he feel uncomfortable in that mini factory? Would he like to try something else? That's how it works. So 10% of the time you go beyond the system, it doesn't work. But 90% of the problems are sorted out on the spot. When you control everything, bad apples thrive. When you control nothing, the bad apples get rooted out, but in a nice way. Generally speaking, those who don't fit in in the Favi system don't stay long. They leave of their own accord. Some people like having someone behind them telling them what to do all the time. The people at Favi prefer responsibility and having more freedom. But liberty has a price. Since the workers at Favi answer to the client, they have to accept a certain degree of flexibility. If there's a rush job, we go around and ask everyone, are you interested in working on Saturday? We're in a bit of a jam and we won't be able to deliver. We always find volunteers. We can react from one day to the next, and that's why we're still here. There's a notion of collective effort shared by all of us. Jean-François Zobrist didn't come up with this successful way of doing things all by himself. He found inspiration in various different models, sharing these ideas with his teams. In 2004, we went to visit some companies in Japan. The Japanese culture is completely different. I think that for the Japanese, the company comes before the family. They live for the company, which isn't exactly the case here. From the Japanese, they took the notion of Kaizen, or continuous improvement adapting it to the Favi way of doing things. We're continually improving at Favi using the Kaizen principle backed up with rewards. Ideas for improvement are implemented in order to increase productivity, safety, ergonomics and overall well-being at the workstations. We have a little box at the staff entrance for anyone who has an idea. And once a month, a jury meets and awards a prize to the two best ideas. The first prize of 1,000 euros is paid over a five-month period, as the second of 500 euros. It's great. Uh, you have a good idea and you're rewarded for it. The last idea I had was a change in the packaging. One of our packages held six pieces, but by changing the way the pieces were placed in the box, we managed to get eight in every box. This improved productivity, reduced the number of boxes we used, and I won a thousand euros. Kaizen or continuous improvement, was first applied in Japan after the Second World War. The country's elite had been wiped out and industry was in a catastrophic state. Some way was needed of motivating the workers and coming up with a whole new way of working. In 1947, 
Japan was still under American occupation. The American sent a consultant, William Edwards Deming, who suggested a new system, lean management. Toyota was one of the first companies to implement it. The Japanese came up with a certain number of approaches, such as Kaizen, continuous improvement, all based on the assumption that to solve problems on the shop floor, no one is better placed than the person on the shop floor. To sum up, he who does, knows. Deming's concept is based on respecting the intelligence of the worker. For him, by simplifying the hierarchy, you make gains in productivity and you reduce costs. With its highly motivated workforce, Japan rapidly became an industrial powerhouse. From the 1960s, Japanese products began to flood the world. This was not to the liking of Western competitors. The arrival of high-performance Japanese motorbikes in the United States seriously troubled the historical manufacturer Harley-Davidson based in Milwaukee in Wisconsin. By the end of the 1970s, Harley-Davidson's technology was lagging behind and a massive strike brought the bike maker to its knees. In 1981, the company was over $70 million in debt. A new financial director, Rich Tierlink, was brought in to turn the situation around. He took inspiration from Japanese lean management ideas basically said we had to adopt some Japanese techniques of just-in-time inventory, employee involvement, those types of things. And that started to get us to understand more fully that our biggest assets are the people who walk through the door every day. At first, employees and unions were suspicious. In order to get off on the right foot, Rich Tierlink asked for everyone, together, to rethink the company's way of doing things. They came up with some very simple things. Let's tell the truth. Let's be fair. Let's keep our promises. Let's respect the individual. And let's encourage intellectual curiosity. The message quickly spread, with even the dealers getting on board. These were values of integrity, I think, uh, to some people, it's common sense, but to others, they don't spend a lot of time thinking about it. And I think it was essential to have those discussions in those early days. Following these consultations, the entire decision-making process was transformed. The human factor was now at the heart of the company's way of functioning, and it pleased the unions. Rich flattened the management structure. Instead of all the bureaucracies at the different levels, he uh, devised a system of circles, which took out a lot of the barriers between just the salaried people, management, and the union. Each plant had a circle of leaders that would actually make the decisions on what to do. So we were able to talk, share ideas, explore avenues we haven't ever gone down before. To get out of the doldrums, everybody agreed to a two-year wage freeze. At the same time, unions, workers and bosses discovered a new and powerful motor, confidence. The employees started catching on very quickly because it was like, okay, I can actually talk to you without being fired. Your door is open, hello. But the biggest challenge was to get the people with the highest titles to buy in. If they couldn't do it, get that concept in their mind, wrap their heart and soul around it, you don't belong here. In the end, we were able to convince 99.9% .9 of the people that uh, this was a good thing. With this new atmosphere of trust, the freshly liberated teams came up with a number of revolutionary innovations. And we saw a new engine design. Uh, we saw a new chassis. 
and the new way to mount the motor and transmission in those chassis, we saw cosmetic enhancements, uh, electronic enhancements, a better engineered product. Sales took off, and salaries, as well as pensions, were soon raised. Riding this creative wave, one employee came up with an idea which would seal the Harley-Davidson legend. If we could create a club that would give the riders a reason to get together on the weekends, they would put more miles on the motorcycle. That's how a unique brotherhood was born around the love of the machine, the Harley Owners Group. So all of a sudden, the, the dealer had a new way to attract his customers and to build a relationship with his customers. It really has been one of the best things I can say personally that's happened to me in life. The relationships I've met uh, in this organization are, are friends that, uh, that I'll cherish forever. Numbering employees as well as customers, the Harley Owners Group has become a family with more than a million members around the world. Everyone's creativity was tapped to get the manufacturer out of its rut and growing again. But for some employees, things changed in 1997, when Rich Tierlink retired. I cried when they announced that he was retiring. And uh, things changed dramatically. As time went on, uh, the circle concept started to deteriorate. There was a hierarchy again. Instead of the employee becoming the most important thing, money became the most important thing. But not everyone is looking on the gloomy side. I think the stock of Harley-Davidson on the New York Stock Exchange today is valued at $15 billion, I think it is. If the shareholders are today reaping the fruits of this success story, it's thanks to the personality of Rich Tierling, an enlightened boss, and his constructive collaboration with the workers and the powerful unions of the time. But over the last quarter century, around the world, unions have seen their role shrink. I think that the ruling class doesn't give you freedoms, liberties, social benefits because they're nice. They don't give you anything because they're nice. They give it because they're afraid. And throughout the latter part of the 19th century and early part of the 20th century, they were scared. It used to be that if they passed legislation that upset a lot of people, there were riots in the streets. I mean, they would write things like, we managed to get that legislation passed with only 37 broken windows. You know? <laughs> it was just assumed that the people would rise up on almost any occasion. They were terrified that something like the French Revolution was going to happen. They made massive concessions. In effect, what they did was with labor unions was that they legalized a form of direct action, what had been a form of revolutionary activity, it was made legal. And the moment it became incorporated into the structure, they slowly began the process of taking that radical edge away. And once they had thoroughly done so, they destroyed the power of the unions because they were no longer threatened. Um, so I, I think it can only be seen in political terms. The ruling class simply isn't scared of the people they govern anymore. And if they're not scared of this, take everything back. The union's troubles are not over. Attracted by the success of the Japanese methods that worked so well at Toyota and Harley, numerous multinationals have created pale imitations to perverse effect. Today, many companies have distorted the principles of lean management by adding a hierarchy of bullshit jobs. Lean management tries to give employees the impression they have a voice. When you have a bit of perspective on that, you realize that finally the space employees are given for expression is very, very controlled. In fact, even if people have been warned there could be negative consequences, these might not be obvious immediately, and they only discover them as time goes by. 
Employees find themselves with forms to fill every day at their station about this or that subject that they didn't have before. So lean management can add a lot of bureaucracy because all these new indicators have to be reported. With all this new bureaucracy and the multiplication of bullshit jobs, lean management can become a minefield for employees who find themselves under even greater pressure in dehumanized environments. Since the only thing the hierarchy has in mind are objectives, in fact, the employee is nothing more than an objective. If you just look at company results, you could say that lean management works. But if you look at it from the point of view of the people in the workplace, a lot of personnel in services find they need to see the company psychiatrist just in case in order to prevent an eventual burnout. A long way from the original concept and with added layers of hierarchy, lean management can be a nightmare. So what's the secret to keeping workers happy and productive in a large multinational? In the 1950s, Bill Gore had some very innovative ideas. At the time, Bill Gore was working as a chemist for chemical giant DuPont. He repeatedly suggested studying new applications for Teflon, but got only systematic refusals from his superiors. In frustration, he decided to start his own family company in 1958. Soon after, his son invented a new material which would go on to be used in the clothing of firemen and ramblers the world over, Gore-Tex. Remembering his frustrating experiences at DuPont, Bill Gore came up with a new philosophy for his business. Make money and have fun doing so. With 10,000 employees spread over five continents, Gore generates an annual turnover of $3 billion. And it does it by giving its employees a surprising amount of freedom. Occasionally someone asks me, Bill, how do you control all these 20 odd plants or whatever they are scattered around the world? I kind of laugh and I say, well, I don't. 55 years later, the Gore culture has survived the demise of its creator, and the current president fondly remembers her own beginnings in the company. I had just uh, graduated, and the Gores were so proud of this new crop of engineers coming into uh, to the enterprise that they had a pool party at their house. And I remember Bill Gore swimming in the pool and Vive was actually uh, cooking burgers. And I just said, that's how every CEO treats their employees. They invite you over to the house, right? And I'm thinking about that now. My house is not big enough for 10,000 associates. 10,000 associates? At Gore, they're not employees, but associates. And all of them have shares in the company, which isn't listed on the stock exchange. No one must feel their creativity is being stifled. Every associate is free to take the initiative without being thwarted by some minor boss. Bill Gore didn't want any hierarchy in his company. He wanted everyone to be free to develop their own talents. But an absence of hierarchy isn't the same thing as anarchy. Bill Gore came up with a system of leaders picked by their own teams. The leader's function is to make sure that a number of people work together, producing a global vision from ideas that come from all around. He's not there to make the final decision. Often it's consensual, but he is there to reformulate things in such a manner that all ideas are taken into account and that the team can go forward with a common vision. How are these leaders chosen then? Ideally, it just becomes obvious who the leader can be. The associates like working with someone because that person is competent, has a vision, and thus is a natural leader. But sometimes it's not so obvious. So we organize sessions to evaluate leaders, and the associates can suggest those who in their mind have leadership potential. 
The system has endured. Director Terry Kelly was herself chosen in 2005 by her colleagues, 25 years after joining Gore, her first job. At Gore, work sites are limited to 250 employees, giving staff a chance to know one another. The big difference is that I can go and see whoever I want, talk to whoever I want without saying, careful, he's the boss. We're all colleagues, we work well together, and what matters is that we can talk to each other openly and honestly. In other companies, that's often very difficult. A Zen atmosphere. Myra isn't a guru, however. Her job title at Gore is European Diversity Champion. She organizes personal development workshops, drums and all. During the sessions, you get beautiful moments when all of a sudden a new door opens. I was working with a colleague who had often been offered the job of a leader, but she was very reluctant, always doubting herself, wondering whether she deserved it and whether she was really capable. But after working on herself, she realized it was a real step forward in her life. Another surprise. The associates here aren't recruited for their qualifications, but for their potential to develop and come up with new ideas, which are, of course, rewarded. Quite a while ago, we took on someone who was actually a butcher. But he caught on quick and was very good at developing the manufacturing process. He's now a leader in manufacturing. He had no technical qualifications, no university degree. But he progressed to his current position purely through talent, enthusiasm and the support of his sponsor. The sponsor, another of Bill Gore's inventions, to help create bonds within the company. Every associate is taken under the wing of a sponsor, who will help them to develop independently of their leader. With their sponsor's guidance, they soon build up a network. Today, Pascal is getting together with his sponsor Norbert, who's been his mentor since he came to Gore five years ago. So are you still thinking of applying for that training course? Yeah, but it's not really the moment right now. In three weeks' time, my son is due. Oh. <laughs> If Pascal comes up with a good idea or invents something, I'll put him in touch with the right people, give him the benefit of my own network, so that his idea gets taken up. When I meet up with my sponsor, it's to get his take from the outside on some problem I might be having, or maybe about something positive. And he can say, look, you've got this option or that option. He might see an option which hadn't occurred to me. He lay it out and, who knows, it may just be what I was looking for. That's how it works for me. Bill Gore's motto, make money and have fun doing so, isn't just a catchy soundbite. Every associate must be free to develop their personal project within the company and genuinely have fun in the process. That's why everyone is given guidance to find their sweet spot. Another Gore concept, which may be the secret of the company's success. The sweet spot is the point where the talents and interests of an associate meet the needs of the company. When you reach your sweet spot, you're maximizing your contribution without even feeling that you're working. Even though it is work, you don't feel like you're working, you're enjoying, you do your work with great pleasure, it's fun. Thanks to the sweet spot, the company's creative and highly motivated associates have developed thousands of new ideas, 
helping the Gore Empire to diversify into many different domains. From cables to clothing, road surfaces, all sorts of products used in the aerospace industry, mechanical engineering, arms, even medicine. Following up the suggestion of one young engineer, Gore even went into the guitar string business. With his motto, make money and have fun doing so, Bill Gore showed true pioneering spirit. More recently, in India, Vinit Nayar has gone even further. As the visionary CEO of IT company HCL Technologies, Vinit Nayar tripled the number of employees from 30,000 to 90,000 with his doctrine, employees first, customers second. For him, we're facing a problem of generational conflict. When you go at home and you deal with your teenagers and sit across a dining table, do you command them and tell them what you want them to do and do they follow? Or has the structure within the house moved away from command and control into more collaboration? Where the leader of the house, which is the husband and the wife, are assuming a role more of mentoring, of influencing thought and enabling the children to be able to do what they really want to do. Now that is completely different to the past where the leader of the house, uh, especially my grandfathers and even my father, was all about command and control. You'll do engineering and we did engineering. You'll be a bureaucrat and you become a bureaucrat. So that has dramatically changed. Now the critical question out here is, if the way you interact with your teenagers at home has changed compared to the way you interacted with your parents, why are you not seeing this change in work? So the reason I call this pyramid structure suffocating for Gen Y is because they're different. Now, would the organizations need to evolve to adopt to the Gen Y or do Gen Y need to adopt uh, to the old traditional organizations? Today, I think that struggle is taking place. Today, the reason people are unhappy is because both sides are struggling to beat each other uh, down to submission of their way of thinking. And that's the reason there is no evolution uh, of what I call happiness in workforce. But if you see the startup organizations, especially coming out of Bay Area and a lot of small startups, they figured this out. They figured out that the more collaborative culture is how we can get the best out of Gen Y, how we can get the most innovation out of Gen Y. And that is the reason they're creating open structures and not the old traditional structures. Open structures, the much talked about economy of sharing. Maybe it's in California that we'll find the ultimate expression of happiness at work. Jaron Lanier, a musician, philosopher and computer scientist, has got to know the major IT companies very well over the last 30 years. But he's far from enthusiastic. When you free people from the 19th century hierarchy, you tend to instead transfer them into a 21st century hierarchy, which is worse. So on the one hand, it's nasty to be in a traditional hierarchy when there seems to be no longer any reason for it. And many companies are structured that way. Believe me, I know. <laughs> but uh, at the same time, consider something like Facebook, where it seems like it's very open, everybody connects to everybody, except it's all owned by one person and controlled by one person, which is amazing. It's a public company owned by one person. That combination is extraordinary, and it wasn't possible before. But digital networks allow you to concentrate so much wealth and so much power that it becomes possible to have an outcome like that. So in a sense, you have um, almost a return to the Pasha or the, you know, the God King or something like that. You know, it's, it's really a return to ancient, ancient times. It's like, it's worse than the 19th century. An hour and a half of traffic jams from San Francisco, Silicon Valley has become the world capital of IT and cutting edge companies. All the giants of the digital economy are here. Google, supposedly the champion in every category of happiness at work. But also Apple, Microsoft, Yahoo, Facebook and the rest. Most have a reputation for being extraordinary places to work. Isaac Getz has studied how they function. 
In Silicon Valley, IT programmers could easily quit their jobs at any moment and go off and find something better paid. So how do you hold on to them? Well, if you lay on free food, massage salons, yoga rooms, sports facilities, free transport, and so on, employees will say, wow, it's a fantastic company and it's really nice to work here. But that has nothing to do with the content of the work, and it's completely different from liberated companies, where people say, it's a fantastic company because they trust me, because they're considerate to me, because they respect me, because I'm fulfilled there. To check whether employees of Silicon Valley are happy in their work, we'd first have to meet them and talk freely. Trouble is, these dynamic companies are none too keen on opening their doors or letting their workers express themselves, unless it's in the presence of a communications representative. I've seen a lot of experiments in company structure in Silicon Valley because it's been very popular. I mean, Silicon Valley is practically a weird, I mean, it's a very weird place. There's all these weird gurus that go around with these ideas about how things should happen. And, you, and so you would think you'd find the most innovative companies here, and yet again and again it reverts to the pyramid model, with the most extreme case being something like uh, Facebook, where it's owned by one person, or Instagram, where only thir there were only 13 employees at all when it was bought by Facebook for a billion dollars, where you have just the incredible concentration of wealth and power with a tiny, tiny class, and it's growing tinier and tinier. It keeps on reverting to this, because the truth is, if you have a system that generates incredible wealth and power for a small number of people, the structure of the company becomes almost a fantasy. Oh yes, when you make the profits these companies do, it's easy to offer incredible working conditions and salary packages. But how do you ensure happiness at work when you don't have those millions to play with? In any case, Vinit Nayar doesn't believe money can buy you happiness. And it's a saying even more relevant today than ever. Money is important as a tool of recognition. Money is important for telling people that you are being fair. Uh, money is a way of uh, taking care of your people if the company is doing well. From all those aspects, money is important. Where do we go wrong with this? We go wrong where we believe money is the only reason for employees to work for you. You must understand that people go to mosque, mandir and churches on Sundays spend their own money, feel good about it. And the reason for that is there is a sense of purpose, there's a sense of fulfillment. So there is something much bigger than themselves. And why do they come to office, get paid for it, and feel bad about it? Is the reason there is no sense of purpose in the organization. So organizations which are only focused on money will get it wrong. Organizations have to be fair and square and compensate people well. But there is 70% of happiness doesn't come from just money, it comes from sense of purpose, giving people the freedom of choice, giving the freedom of transparency and getting people to play the game they want to play. Money doesn't motivate people. It motivates people for a very, very short time. What motivates people is respect, is trust, is knowing they are doing things which are bigger than themselves and they are doing it with other people. It's a bit of brotherhood feeling. Also, this, this is what motivates people. And they want to work for organizations which are looked well upon by society. Frank van Massenhove is a Belgian senior civil servant. He arrived in 2002 at the head of a moribund Ministry of Social Security with a mission to get things moving. While the liberation we saw earlier at Belgium's Ministry of Transport is just getting underway, and not without some pains, Frank van Massenhove began his efforts 12 years ago. We were an ordinary, old-fashioned ministry, and the biggest problem was how do we get the people we need? Because the people didn't want to work here. They thought we were bland, we were boring, we had a boring job, and it wasn't. So we were thinking about young people. We call them the millennials, people who are born after uh, 1984, 1985. How do they think? What is their culture? And we wanted to have an institution which has their culture, not our culture. The first thing we thought was they don't want us to tell them when they have to work and where they have to work. The idea was revolutionary at the time. 
To put such a system in place in a government ministry, Frank van Massenhove had to tread lightly. I knew that if I went to a minister in the beginning and say we won't tell people when and where to work, they would go berserk, they would be crazy. So I didn't. I did it under the radar. And after three, four years, they said, hey, what have you been doing there? I said, sorry, we can't get back now. It's sorry, it's too late to stop now. And then they saw the results, and the results were better than beforehand. So they wanted to be in the picture, and we put them in the picture. The first stage was to make it possible for people to work from home for up to three days a week. Three days a week at home for a father with an eight-year-old child is wonderful. Yesterday I fetched my son from school, helped him with homework, and then did another couple of hours work in the evening. Classic workday, maybe a bit shorter than usual. But how does working from home work? Near Leuven, Kern Vlemix is working from home on pension reform. Come in. My computer is linked to the Federal Public Service Network. We also have instant messaging software, so I'm in direct contact with my colleagues. It works well, there's not really any need to see each other in the flesh the whole time. And if I need to study a document, for example, I prefer doing so at home because I can really concentrate. No one is forced to work from home, of course. Each person is free to do what they feel most comfortable doing. There are people who live alone and prefer coming to the office every day. They see people every day, like before, maybe a little bit less, but they do see people every day. The drawback is that you're available evenings and weekends, but that's not really abused. Under normal circumstances, no one bothers you in the evening or at the weekend. Everyone's working hours are respected. With the new system, the ministry's results improved greatly in a very short time. The fear that we could have had is that people would be less motivated if they were working from home. But in fact, it's the opposite. Since we brought these new rules in, the treatment time for completing a file has been reduced from about 18 months to almost four and a half months. That's a huge gain. A huge gain. And yet midweek, there doesn't seem to be much work going on here. The reason being that a large proportion of the ministry's 5,000 employees are working from home. Another advantage is that, needing less office space than before, the ministry has managed to make considerable savings. The funds thus freed have gone towards creating bright, open office spaces, while also sorting out a few technical problems along the way. This is the Verhaderzaal. This is a conference room, although at first sight it might not look like one. Through there, too, there's a conference room, but as you can see, there's no wall between the two. Which means we have to be very careful about noise. When two groups are having meetings at the same time, we must ensure they don't disturb each other. To help with this, we installed an active noise reduction system, so we can work in a nice, calm atmosphere. It's more or less the same atmosphere wherever you go, one that's conducive to communication. Nobody has their own office. As you can see, everyone just works where they like. I also work in a different place every day, in the midst of my colleagues. The directors are on the same floor, so we can see them as much as they can see us. So that allows much more conviviality. Although some middle managers at the ministry didn't much like the change in status, they didn't really have any say in the matter. For 80% of our middle management, that was not a problem. But for 20% it was a problem. And 10% was a real problem. And so what did we do? We let middle management be evaluated by their people. And when they got a bad evaluation, they were no longer boss. So they had to change. There was no alternative. Once a year, I get to evaluate my boss, explain what's not working and what could be improved to make the team work better and get better results. We need people management. And so when people think their bosses are no good coaches, are not working on their competences, on the functioning of teams, they throw them out in reality. And we throw them out. 
With bosses ready to listen and smooth running teams, the personnel at the ministry feel confident about taking initiatives. Some ministries still function in the old way, with very strict rules. The minister asks the president a question, who in turn asks the director, etc., etc. Here it's more simple. We can propose projects to the minister directly. Even better, one can speak one's mind freely. The employees are encouraged to speak up on social media, for better or for worse. In most of the organizations, you are not supposed to be on social media during the working hours, but we don't have working hours. So we beg our people to be on social media. We have just one simple rule. You always should tell the truth. But the truth can be a truth which is not very good for us. We don't care. If it is the truth, they can tell it. And every time we go out and we say we have a problem, People say, fantastic what they are doing. Whether in the private sector or in public services, in the era of social media, transparency will clearly be a key factor of our working lives in the future. For Vinit Nayar, who now gets invited by top bosses around the world to come and share his avant-garde ideas, transparency must begin at the highest level of the company. Before digital, we used to communicate, right? So CEOs and management will communicate something and people had no, no means of knowing what our real intention were. With digital coming in, with everything we communicate, there is a digital word out there where people exchange notes and your true intention is known. If you communicate something else and your intention is something else, you will be discovered and you will lose huge amount of credibility and after that you will not be able to win the confidence. Communication has lost its relevance. Intention is the most important. So as leaders, your intention should be very clear and communicate honestly what your intention is and you will earn the trust. Trust. That's something society as a whole is sorely in need of. Isn't the current downturn a crisis of trust? The system itself is crumbling. We have a debt situation, an inequality situation, an environmental situation, which is clearly untenable. The problem is we also have a political class that is so heavily invested in the idea that any kind of visionary politics is impossible, that they're no longer capable of any kind of reaction appropriate to the scale of the problem. We also need to think about the world we're living in, in which the human aspect is always the first factor we can adjust. It's always short-term. In fact, we're in a short-term dictatorship. And yet everyone agrees that we have to improve job security, escape poverty, create employment, re-industrialize the country. Faced with all these problems, I'm firmly convinced that the company has an important role to play, an essential role. And this leads to another reflection, which is that most companies are neither very innovative nor very inspiring. So we have to do things differently. Doing things differently. What if that means getting back to basics, to trusting human beings to do what they're capable of? Some people have already found a way to do just that. If companies don't try new solutions, we'll never get anywhere. And if we stay with the old systems, we can't go forward. We can't get ahead. If you go, I don't know, to Eastern Europe or Asia, labor is cheaper than it is here. Everyone knows that. We have to win on another playing field.